programme. Um, we've got Hans Steenbergen, I hope that's correct, uh, from uh, a, a biodynamic uh, farmer with more than 20 years experience of seed production um, for Stormy Hall Seeds and also uh, a co-founder of the, the Seed Co-op, which one is, is one of uh, the largest seed companies in the UK and growing quickly. Um, and then we've, we're going to have a presentation from uh, Pippa Chapman of uh, Those Plant People. Pippa is a smallholder, a master gardener and horticulturalist, sorry, master horticulturist, I think. Um, and uh, uh, Pippa is, is experimenting with plant breeding um, on her small holding in North Yorkshire on a, a steep slope in a uh, north facing slope. <laughs> Um, and uh, then we have Maria, who's uh, one of the coordinators for the Seed Sovereignty Programme uh, for Gaia as well, uh, who's working in the uh, highlands and islands of Scotland. So um, if it's OK, uh, Becky, would you be happy to do a little bit of an intro to the tech side of things for people? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I was just checking I've let everyone in. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's if you've been to sessions before everyone, it should be fairly familiar. So um, the first thing to say is that um, I'm going to I'm recording the session for the for the NRFC if that's OK. So if you don't um, want to be recorded, please keep your video off. Um, what else do I need to tell you? So if we can stay muted when we're not speaking, that's good for everyone's sound quality. Um, if you have questions as you go along, you can type in the chat and I'll try and keep an eye on them later and, and uh, sort of like uh, relay them to the speakers. And a bit later on, like as Charlie said, we'll try and go into breakout room. So again, it should send you a little invite to the breakout room and you just click join and it'll bring you back automatically. I know it's a little bit scary the first time, but it's not like going in a TARDIS, you do come back <laughs> fine. So if there's any other questions but on the tech side of things, please pop them in the chat or say now. Thanks, Fantastic. Thank you, Becky. So, uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll pass over to Sinead uh, for her presentation. Great. Thanks, Charlie. I'm just going to share my screen. Fingers crossed it works appropriately. Just give me a nod if you can see that. Great. And Come on. Great. OK. Um, yeah. Thanks, Charlie. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today to talk about seed sovereignty. As Charlie said, I'm the program manager for the Seed Sovereignty program, which is a UK and Ireland wide program. Uh, we've been running since 2017 and we're run by the Gaia Foundation. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background about why we're doing what we're doing um, before going into some of the politics of it and the, the global seed scene. Uh, in 2015, there was a feasibility study taken by the Gaia Foundation to get a sense of what seed security and seed sovereignty was like in the UK and Ireland. Uh, and what we found was that people were really enthusiastic, really excited, um, but there were very few people actually working in seed sovereignty. So uh, Charlie mentioned the Seed Cooperative, which is a fantastic open pollinated uh, seed company, uh, a cooperative, obviously. Uh, in the UK, you've got real seeds and you've got a very small number of, of uh, small independent seed sellers. Um, but on a larger scale, there wasn't a huge amount happening compared to some of our counterparts in Canada or the US or France or other places in Europe. Uh, so we decided that we wanted to do something about that. Um, and we've been working mostly through training uh, over the past few years to get growers trained up in seed production uh, and uh, connect them with uh, some of the open pollinated seed sellers that we have in the UK uh, and Ireland and just generally raise awareness about open pollinated seed, about locally produced seed, uh, the benefits of it and why why everyone should be caring about it, why all growers should be you know, thinking about where their seed comes from. Um, so without further ado, just some numbers to throw at you. Uh, so 60% uh, of the seed market internationally is now controlled by four seed companies. And I'll go a little bit more into that and why that's important. Um, we've lost 75% of our agricultural plant diversity since 1900. And about 80% of organic vegetable seed uh, is estimated to be imported into the UK each year. Um, so on the first figure, the seed industry, now I won't 
I won't go too heavily into this because uh, I, I have no idea how that even shows up on your screen if it's visible. But basically, the long story short is uh, the seed uh, situation used to be small companies uh, running for, for quite a long time, uh, very close to farmers um, and uh, very in touch with, with what growers needed um, and what was regionally appropriate. Uh, since the 1980s, this has been, uh, the landscape has changed dramatically uh, and thousands of seed companies have been bought by petrochemical, pharmaceutical and commodity grain companies. Um, and there's some of the usual suspects there uh, that you'll recognize from many uh, food sovereignty discussions. Um, so instead of having, uh, yeah, small independent companies that are well uh, in tune with what growers need and, and the various quirks and changes to their local climate. You've got these massive conglomerates of international petrochemical companies um, who are there to serve their, their shareholders instead of uh, anything like biodiversity or uh, food security. So in terms of biodiversity, um, this is this is actually um, from the US, this, this diagram, but it, it, it illustrates really well when we talk about loss of biodiversity. Um, so as I said, 75% of our, our plant biodiversity has been lost in the last, uh, the last um, century. So if you look at, for example, lettuces, uh, this is one, one company, one seed house, um, offered 497 varieties of lettuce. And then in 1983, it offered 36. So when you think about it, that's, you know, that's a lot of varieties of lettuce. But what that actually means is some of those lettuces are going to be really good in warmer climates. Some are going to be really good in cooler climates. Some are going to uh, you know, be bolt hardy. Uh, others are going to do well with drought. There's going to be a wide variety of um, features and, uh, you know, different strengths uh, to these varieties that have been lost. Um, again, this, the 36 varieties, and this was in 1983, so it's even worse now, but the 36 varieties of lettuces that are still grown are no doubt the ones that are the most popular. Um, so pot potentially, you know, lettuces that are uniform in shape or um, they sit well on the shelf, they look nice, um, they, they might store particularly well in the supermarket, but they might not necessarily be particularly resilient to some of the extreme weather conditions that we're experiencing now. So as we all know as growers, um, you know, we need to look to more diversity in our crops in order to weather some of the, the, the extreme weather conditions we're getting. Um, so part of what the program does is not only the diversity in the plants themselves, but the diversity across the various uh, countries and regions of the UK and Ireland. Um, a leek that's been grown in uh, Shetland wouldn't be too happy down in Bristol and vice versa. We have a, a very wide range of climates within these small islands. Um, and so the more localized and the more specialized the varieties that you're growing to your soil conditions and your weather conditions, um, the, the better that they'll do. Um, so yeah, just to, to, to talk a wee bit more about why it matters. So uh, we touched on plant biodiversity and uh, in, in diversity is strength, as we all know. You know, you want to be uh, growing many varieties, many crops, and especially as we have unpredictable weather conditions increasing with, with global climate change. Uh, this is something that we, we really need to focus on as growers. Um, also having an independent and diverse food system. So a food system that's uh, set up in order to uh, nourish communities and re rejuvenate and regenerate uh, ecosystems rather than to increase the profits of shareholders, um, which I'm sure is a sentiment that many share. Uh, and finally, the heritage and culture of our seeds. So our seeds are so much part of who we are. The food that we grow, you know, how they're grown, the names behind them. Uh, there's some really, really beautiful stories um, in our own communities and in communities right across the world uh, about seeds and how they came to be. Uh, when you look at a seed that you've bought from hopefully the seed co-op or real seeds or have saved yourself, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're the first person to touch that seed, but that, that seed has been, um, it's been cultivated by thousands of years of, of human love. Uh, so whether it has been bred more recently um, uh, and uh, naturally selected uh, and then just you know, bred by our ancestors, these seeds come from all over the world and they have um, a remarkable story to tell. So they really are something truly special. Um, and we want more people to get excited about them and more people to get involved. 
Um, so what we do is a program. Uh, we support uh, the network and build seed hubs across uh, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, in England. Um, so when we say seed hubs, we mean these networks of growers, of seed producers, seed sellers, community groups, uh, seed banks, seed libraries, anything to do with seed, basically. Um, and, you know, provide opportunities, uh, offer support where needed, uh, any resources that are needed for uh, training, um, for uh, routes to market. Uh, we've been looking a lot at supply chains recently. So, for example, um, anyone who grows oats with the hulls on will know the um, the pain of trying to dehull oats on a small scale. So that's something that we're looking at at the moment: how to uh, build uh, an open source uh, or open plan, open source uh, dehuller, so that people can grow heritage oats on a smaller scale and still process them and get them to market. Um, so also training and supporting with community groups as well as commercial growers. So when we say commercial growers, we mean generally market gardeners, uh, small-scale agroecological market gardeners, um, as well as education and general awareness raising with the public. So whether that be through our Seed Week, which is going to be in February this year or next year coming, um, variety events, um, just kind of generally getting the word out there, getting people excited about what, what it means to have seed diversity. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on legislation, policy and um, Brexit at the moment, which is fun. Um, obviously, legislation is, is, is quite up in the air at the moment. So we're working with DEFRA and uh, a forum of seed producers in order to make sure that everyone's informed and everyone's collaborating and we, we can try and find the best way forward for the small scale agroecological seed sector. And then finally, we do various variety trials, work with heritage grains and, and pretty much anything else. You know, if anyone has a, an exciting idea or something they'd really like to get involved in, just get in touch with us because we're, uh, we're generally an excitable bunch and we love to get involved in various different things. Um, so if you go to our website, seedsovereignty.info, you can find your local coordinator there and either reach out to them or if it's a general program inquiry, uh, you know, feel, feel free to reach out to myself. Um, and yeah, I think I'll pass it over there and stop blabbing. Um, Charlie? No, Charlie. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think next, uh, Hans, were, were you to speak next? You're muted, Hans, if you're, oh, yeah. Okay, so I will share my screen and show you some pictures of seed growing here in North Yorkshire, uh, where I've been based for over the last 30 years or longer. And um, I came into seed growing. I was first uh, of all uh, a dairy farmer, but we grew cereals. We saved always the seed from our own barley and done so for over 25 years. Um, but uh, through the Biodynamic Seed Group, uh, which started in 1985 already, I came involved with vegetable seeds. And um, what I've uh, sort of noticed over the years is that a, a, a good network of growers um, who maintain varieties locally is very important, uh, especially for open pollinated varieties, which are sold now uh, through the seed co-op. Um, we want to offer seeds which are locally adapted. And we even had the idea that from similar varieties, we would offer local adapted varieties. But the problem is, of course, we have only few growers and um, compared to Germany, for instance, where a similar sort of seed cooperative is working where they have over 100 growers, we only got to about 10 growers. So I will just start a screen sharing and show you pictures of what has happened. Um, so. So 
Can you see that? So there, over the years, uh, for us, seed sovereignty is important. Um, and as I said, uh, the on-farm selection is for me the most important part. Um, we've noticed that varieties which were selected on farm um, did, did very well in, on that farm. When they were moved to other areas in Britain, they didn't, didn't perform as well. I wouldn't say they performed badly, they were average. But so that uh, really pointed us towards that uh, the importance of on-farm maintenance. Um, the other important thing, of course, as a seed company, you're very much um, confined to the regulations. It's a very regulated market seeds. Uh, there are all, all, a lot of restrictions. And um, that's why the sort of work which is done now with Brex on Brexit is very important. Uh, we, we're about to lose uh, a lot of varieties again, which can't be marketed in the UK. Um, the other important thing is um, breeding programs. Now, maintenance, uh, maintaining of varieties and, and breeding new varieties is fairly similar. Um, uh, but there has been no new varieties bred really in the UK uh, yet for for organic growing uh, and we're lagging behind in that you know with, with other countries uh, particularly Germany and Switzerland where they have uh, real breeding programs open pollinated varieties uh, coming on the market which are specially bred for organic or, or biodynamic farming. Um, now, I've been always based in the north, uh, part of our group where other growers based in Scotland, uh, but, you know, plant breeding and, and maintenance of plant breeding takes a long time and people's circumstances changes and, um, you know, a lot of valuable work is lost. So an uh, organisation um, like um, um, who can then keep keep these varieties going, albeit with, on other places and so on, is important. So, so we 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 uh, you know we preserve heritage varieties, but we also should preserve locally maintained varieties uh, which have the pedigree you know for that for particular areas. Um, just looking at my list. Um, I think that's basically it. What I wanted to say, you know. So it's very important for 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 um, the seed co-op that we have growers in many areas and growers which which are involved and and can maintain and even breed new varieties. Um, and you know the security of that side of the of the of the work uh, is not very high because there are so few people involved and uh, we've seen you know through many crises you know the the COVID crisis um, puts a lot of strain on on the seed co-op uh, and Brexit is another crisis but in the past we had um, other crises you know the whole threat of g genetic modified um, seeds coming on the market and when I started, you know, the biggest threat was, you know, not even having organic seed uh, available. Uh, you couldn't even buy untreated seed. So, so all these crises sort of, you know, sort of put you, um, put the importance of a good seed network, a lot of growers involved, diverse areas where you can grow seed and where people maintain seed. So, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. And, yeah. Thank you, Hans. Um, I'm really sorry my, my internet went a bit wobbly, so I dropped off the call. So thank you for making that transition. I yeah. heard most of uh, yeah. Nade's presentation. Thank you. Um, wonderful photographs of what it looks like to be producing seed uh, at that kind of scale. That's great. Um, so yeah, Pippa, are you happy to present next? 
Uh, yes, yes. Thank I, haven't you. Got, I haven't got a slideshow. I've just got some bits here to show you. Um, I thought it'd be better to talk with the stuff that I've actually grown. Uh, so yeah, I, it was wonderful to see all those pictures. And um, what we're growing is on a massively smaller scale, really. We've got um, five acres in West Yorkshire on a northwest facing slope, but really we only cultivate a very, very small amount of it. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to find seeds uh, that are going to give varieties that grow, you know, particular to our site, they're going to actually give us a crop. Um, and it was really interesting, you know, what um, Sinead was saying at the beginning about um, sort of all the commercial varieties, um, you know, now, now we've lost a lot of varieties, a lot of the varieties that remain are commercial varieties and they're plants that are grown in, you know, the best conditions with brilliant sunlight, lots of rich soil, um, and we don't have any of those things on our site. So, um, you know, we've been breeding our own varieties specifically for our site, you know, sort of uh, ones that are locally adapted to our area. Um, we've, uh, my husband Andrew bought me this book. Um, it's called Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties by Carol Deppy, which was fantastic. Um, and so we've uh, used some of the knowledge from there some of her experiences um, to sort of put together different breeding programs and we we tried to sort of have a look at what are the most important crops for us here and so it's it's some of our staple crops so things like tomatoes um, pumpkins and potatoes so things that we use a lot of uh, so we we've got behind me i've got some pumpkins here this is a, a well it's sort of more of a, a um, a breeding program that we've done so we, we bred uh, some initial crosses of varieties we used crown prints and burgess buttercup and one called sweet meat and so we did some crosses initially and then we've slowly been breeding those um, mixes so sowing different seeds and letting them um, open pollinate with each other and so what we've got now are varieties that are sort of have characteristic characteristics of all those three different varieties initially and the main things that we were selecting for when we first decided to do breeding um, we had to try and look for some of these varieties that are actually really hard to find now where we're not just growing you know show big pumpkins or you know we're not growing for um, uh, just ones that look nice you know we were growing for some of the things that seem less important in seed catalogues now so things like storage um, ability uh, and things like that so um, we, we've tried to look back at lots of other varieties which were actually really hard to find the seeds of and so then use those and breed them trial them and then um, make these crosses so now what we've got is this seed mix so all of the fruits behind me um, as we eat those we will be um, saving the seeds from them and then we'll mix them all up in a bag and then we'll just sow a mix of those next year. So now that we've bred some plants that we like and we've trialed them uh, and we like the crosses, we'll now be just making more of a seed mix. So it's sort of looking at um, creating things like land races. So that's a sort of a collection of seeds really of, of a certain plant that you can sort of adapt locally to your site so we've done that with um with the pumpkins and we're doing it with other things as well we've been trying to do a a, a grex mix um a, a mix of beans and it's all about keeping the genetics as wide as possible so um just as Sinead was talking about earlier sort of making a seed mix that's really resilient so you might have some plants that uh, within that mix, some plants that grow better in a hot year, some plants that grow better in a cool year. And so if you have all those seeds together as a mix and you sow them all together, um, then at least some of those plants are going to do well, you know, hopefully, <laughs> whatever your conditions. So a, a lot of the challenge has been trying to find those initial varieties. Um, as Sinead was talking about, actually trying to get hold of, of a wide range of varieties has been quite a challenge. Um, so it's really about relocalizing varieties, um, trying to make things that are, are adapted to our northwest facing slope in Yorkshire. And part of that has been tomatoes has been a real challenge. We need um, 
we need really early varieties you know we need really early fruiting tomatoes in our area because we just have really short season um, the sun leaves our site really early so you know we, we need fruit that ripen really early and we also want disease resistance because we're growing in an organic system so we've had to try and um, you know cross plants that have really good disease resistance with really early varieties to try and get ones that are suited to our site. Um, I haven't got any of the tomatoes to show you now because we've uh, made them all into passata and eaten them all but I have um, if anyone's wanting to sort of have a look at our site and see what we've been doing we have got some um, videos on YouTube um, we've talked quite a bit about the different breeding and things that we do here uh, and um, another one that we've done which we're quite uh, pleased with is we did some um, true seed for a potato so we actually gathered our own seed uh, we did we bought from our local potato day we bought all the varieties that we could that had uh, the flavor that we like the disease resistance and um, the uh, storing ca capacity because with all the things that we grow you know flavor is really important disease resistance is really important and so is the the storage qualities of them so we um, gathered some some fruits from the potato plants uh, open pollinated all the different varieties and we mixed all that seed together sow the seed um, and as it was growing we actually introduced um, blight to the potatoes so we got some leaves that had blight on put them around with the seedlings and then any that survived that we knew were blight resistant and so then we've grown those on and so by doing this um, here we've, we've really managed to get uh, start to see uh, massive improvements in in our yields with what we're growing and also with with no you know um, not using any pesticides or anything like that you know so it's it's really about growing and adapting seeds to our site so what i'm hoping to do now in the next few years now that we have a few interesting varieties is try and share those um, with other people in this area see how those varieties might do in other people's sites as well um, so yeah i just wanted to give a, a kind of brief introduction really to to the challenges that we have here and why we're breeding our own varieties um, I think the frustration is having to grow on such a small scale you know I've looked in envy at Hans's pictures of all these giant fields of, of, uh, of varieties yeah we're growing on a much much smaller scale here but it's it's you know it's still possible it's really enjoyable um, and yeah to be able to share those with other people um, is you know it's something we're really looking to do. Thank you, Pippa. That was fantastic. It's lovely to see, uh, yeah, some of the the end products and and what you're working on yeah. uh, next. Um, well, the middle products, I should say, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. ongoing product. Um, yeah, and I think it's really important that we, you know, we think about uh, the seed saving at different scales, and that you know we can do it in. in uh, different spaces and adapt things to our own spaces so it's really really valuable work that you're doing there um, yeah. and it, yeah and great to see the the different uh, different sizes of what we can do and we need all of it to make our system more resilient yeah um, yeah so uh, there's a couple of uh, comments in the chat section um, what I'll do is I'll encourage Maria to present now um, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions for any, any of the presenters at the end, if that's OK. And then we'll go into discussion uh, rooms. OK, thanks. Uh, so, Becky, if you're OK to share the slides for Maria. <coughs> Looks like it's that's working. working. Yep, good. Yay. <laughs> shout, maybe shout change at me, Maria, when you want me to change and I will. Yeah, change, please. <laughs> yes. Oops. So I'm based in Inverness, my name is Maria Scholten. Um, I have been working with the Seed Sovereignty Programme since 2018 and I had done work before on land races and crofting. And for me, from the start of the Seed Sovereignty Programme, I was really thinking, how can I roll out this program, uh, this Seed Sovereignty Programme in crofting areas and what is the connection? And of course, I've been working in very remote areas. If you think about Shetland, Shetland, the Shetland Islands were cut off from the mainland for months during winter. So crofters had to be very self-reliant. 
and I don't think it's an accident that some of the land races that survived are on those very remote areas, very remote islands and grofting areas. For example, on the Outer Hebrides, um, there are still land races grown there and they're used for fodder. And it's just a way for crofters to keep their inputs low and also to, to save that way, to save uh, on, on money, on, on, on seed imports. And it's a beautiful example of self-reliance. You could almost say it's a little pocket of seed sovereignty there. Um, in my talk, some of you may have seen the slides yesterday. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how I've tried to roll out this program in uh, Highland areas and also to be a bit philosophical about what is heritage grain. As I said before, on, say for example, on the Outer Hebrides, the, the fodder, the, the grains they are grown for fodder, these are land races. There's not much sentimentality or nostalgia there. This is just for economics. Um, it's just, you may have seen a, a BBC Alaba um, documentary about crofting on US last year. And one of the crofters said, if we cannot produce our seed there again, the whole system would collapse because we depend on, on these cheap seeds, cheap feed, and um, hopefully the Scottish government will listen in and say, do something about the geese unused. Anyway, that's politics. Okay, going to my program. Um, in 2018, I had seen a piece in the Crofter before uh, titled, where did all the oats go? Well, uh, the oats will come back. And immediately when I launched uh, the program announced it. I got uh, uh, feedback from crofters interested in growing grain again. And, um, and that's where we started. Um, I could help with making seed available. Um, and last year we had some really beautiful events um, that I will just quickly pass on. And um, just to give you a feel of what we did and where we are based and the projects involved there. And and because there is something, I mean, most of the heritage grain that people are aware about are on Orkney. Orkney is famous for its bear, the bannocks, the work with the whiskey the distillery. And when I started announcing that, okay, we're going to try this in the Highlands on the mainland, uh, BBC Alaba was interested and uh, we had some good uh, film material there. You can still see the film clips um, if you look at that. Um, most of it is in Gaelic, but um, yeah, some parts are in English as well. Um, next slide, please. Oops. So in 2019, uh, we could do, or we had a, uh, an experiment on the shielding just outside of Bewley. The shielding is an education project uh, looking at sustainable, um, sustainable living off-grid. It's completely off-grid um, that take people out um, and it's really in a crofting context. There's a lot of Gaelic culture uh, woven into their program. Um, and here you can see we did a, a sewing event early 2019. Uh, this was in collaboration with the James Hutton Institute and with Soil Association Scotland. Um, and there on the right side, you can see that was in June, how the crop came up. You can see that we had a problem with uh, the density, uneven uh, emergence. There was a huge weed pressure because of the, it was the first year, I think since a hundred years that this field had been um, cultivated. Next slide, please. And we had a, a, a kind of a harvesting small scale equipment event in October on the shielding. And by that time, everyone started becoming very interested in harvesting and in machinery, how to clean the, the seeds, how to process them. And Sinead has said already, dehulling is a big issue. And um, you can see here, yeah, there's a big interest in, in machinery. And um, one of the crofters is now on a, on a wee side project to develop small scale uh, 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 machinery specifically for, for seed processing. Next slide, please. We did, uh, in midsummer, we had a, a beautiful event on Lismore that was again with the Soil Association. Um, we had, I think, over 30 participants there. And the beauty there was, um, you can see on the right side, we were looking at uh, inspection of, of a crop, uh, of an oat field there. Uh, so we had some field work, but we also were congregating in the village hall. And the beauty there was 
there were presentations. Peter Martin was there from Orkney to talk about bear and the markets for bear. But very almost automatically, organically, the local people from Lismore started talking like, what machinery is still around? And then the Holocrofters started memorizing and they could even memorize the names of the varieties that were grown in, in, their, well, in their lifetime. Which is beautiful again, that this program can tap into that self-reliance that was once there. And on the left side, you can see the harvest there in 2019, quite a nice harvest. Um, I think, um, but then again, we run, or Mike ran into this issue of not being able to de -hull. So he did a lot of sieving uh, for his porridge oats. Next slide, please. Yeah, why are these growers so interested in growing heritage grains? And again, I would like to emphasize heritage. Um, yeah, heritage is a good. They're interested in this because we know this is tough stuff. These land traces can grow with low inputs. They don't need a lot and they can stand the weather. Otherwise, it's just curiosity to, to, try, to, to try this out. Again, there's not much sentimental or nostalgia there because these, are, these new growers are experimenting. They, a lot of them want to develop their own local varieties. But on the other hand, having said that, bear is kind of a sexy crop. There's value in it. There's, you know, you, you name barley, a traditional barley, and you think whiskey or other beverages. So it's an interesting crop. But for most of the crop, for most of the novice growers, um, they want to become more self-sufficient in feed. They want to do more homegrown protein. They want to use it for their own consumption of porridge or bannocks or use straw for bedding, the straw for crafts, uh, on the shielding, of course, for education, for demonstration purposes. And all of this really, I think, feeds in really nicely in this whole idea of more local food, more self-reliance, lower of fewer inputs, and in other words, more food and seed sovereignty. Next slide, please. Challenges are plenty. There was sourcing the seed. Luckily, we were in contact with James Hutton and they've made a lot of uh, bear seed available. Um, so anyone interested in growing bear next year, please get in contact. Um, Know-how is also, of course, an issue. But again, by bringing in the older crofters in different communities, we are still able to tap into that knowledge. The, crofters are, the crofting knowledge is still there. Some of the machinery is still there, as you can see here on this more. I don't know where this machinery came from, but it was just in time for harvest. The soils are in general, I mean, this is West Scotland, the soils are not the best anyway. Um, many have not been used for a long time. Uh, weed pressure is enormous. And I think one of the biggest challenges is predation by deer and geese. And the deer issue is really also closely associated with land management issues in the, in the Highlands in general. And I haven't even talked about uh, marketing yet. Next slide, please. So in 2020, we had a good start. We had an enormous, uh, oh, enormous, yeah, really many people signing up for seed for bear um, through the James Hutton. And luckily I could ship out some, some seeds to um, the Koyak um, Ascent Living Landscape Project. They're running a, a demonstration croft just north of Alapool, and they were able to do some sowing there. There's a little video clip there that I can show and again, it's nice to, to link in with the community project. And again, this field um, had not been used for decennia. And it was also interesting to see um, how that would come along. But otherwise, all events were, were done through Zoom. We can go to the next slide first and then do the video at the end. Yeah, next slide, please. Oops, no, no, the previous one, please. Yeah, that was just one. My, well, my last slide was about an event. Yeah, this is um, this is actually last Saturday. This was my first live event uh, with COVID restrictions. Very um, and it was just catching up for all of us. Um, and it was I, I called it uh, a mini field school. What we did was check in the field, check the crops. Um, we did a, kind of a testing, like what do we think is a good seed head? Comparing seed heads. Um, we looked at the latest machinery, uh, machine, again, that's the ongoing topic. 
and we had a look at, at again, the, the, the continuing problem of de-hulling on the right side there, looking at oats and the oats from last year and the de-hulling. Uh, but it was good to, to get back in the field and to see how are the crops doing and how can we do this under COVID restrictions. Um, and everyone, yeah, this is really something that I think has put roots on. These crofters are very dedicated to keep this going and to link it in with local food and um, local food production very much in, in, a, in a food sovereignty framework. Yeah, that's it. My, uh, more information, just email or put it in the chat box, please. Thank you. Or we can have a look at the video, but um, not necessarily. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, so we've had some quite different uh, presentations on seed saving in different places at different scales and different crops. Hopefully the video will play and then um, we'll have a, after this, we've got a few minutes for questions and then we'll have a break and then come back for discussion. Yeah. The video can also be seen on YouTube. If you go to Koyak Ascent Living Landscape, then it will show, um, and it's only not even two minutes, but it gives you an impression of, of uh, what was happening in Achotevui earlier this year. Sorry, I think I was on the wrong. Uh, was, were you seeing the video then or not? No. No. Right. Let me uh, let me have another go. Hang on, two secs, and we should see if we can get get this video. Uh, because I had it playing here, but I wasn't sharing it with you, I realised. Hang on. Uh, Sorry, just give me a second. Uh, try again. Oh, here we go. Hang on. Right. Sorry, we'll start again uh, from this. Brilliant. You can see the seed fiddle. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, the sound wasn't working for me. I'm assuming it wasn't working for other people either. Is that the case? Um, it was but just if, music, yeah. Oh, okay, there's some lovely music on that film. So it's worth having a look on YouTube. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. So thanks to all the presenters. We've had a couple of questions um, in the chat. Um, so one question for Hans is, um, is Stormy Hall Seeds still selling or, or have it, has it been let go as it were. Um, you need to unmute Hans. Okay. Thank you. So Stormy Hall Seed, all the activity which used to happen at Stormy Hall have now moved to the seed co-op and um, the owner of the land here at Stormy Hall uh, has decided not to carry on seed growing uh, but I'm privately um, still maintain uh, varieties and um, have access to to some land we bought last year uh, for the Esk Valley community, uh, which has separated off from the Camp Hill Bottom community. Uh, so I've started to grow seeds there again, and um, they will be sold through the seed co-op. 
but I'm concentrating mainly on breeding new varieties and maintaining varieties and advising the seed co-op growers. Thank you. Yeah, and we're very lucky to have Pan's presence in the north of England. Uh, so certainly I, will, I hope that we'll be able to, uh, yeah, that you'll be an act, be a, yeah, an advisor and active in these networks as well. So that that's uh, you're an amazing resource for for us. Um, and the, another question was for Sinead, which uh, is, are Gaia working with the Heritage Seed Library? Oh yeah, no, so Heritage Seeds. Sorry, I answered that briefly in the chat. I took it as the Heritage Seed Library. Uh, which is how I responded. So if not, apologies. We um, we do work in collaboration with the Heritage Seed Library, which is a great organization based out of Garden Organic. Um, they keep all sorts of wild and wonderful heritage seeds. Please do look them up. Um, we collaborate on training, so they help with our Wales trainings. And actually, um, we have some Welsh growers who have been um, growing some heritage seed varieties for a few years and they've done very well. They've adapted to their local growing conditions and they're actually going to start uh, providing them to the public again. Um, so there's some interesting crossovers there. Um, generally speaking, we are hoping to run um, more widespread variety trials. So we do it on a small scale at the moment, uh, depending on the network and, and the coordinators, uh, you know, basically how much work they have on. <laughs> <laughs> how much they can fit it into their schedules. Um, but we are hoping to do more widespread uh, variety trials, testing particular crops up and down uh, the UK and Ireland. Uh, so do watch this space for that. Hopefully, well, I'm not going to put a deadline on that because I don't know when we'll get the word about it. But uh, yeah, hopefully. And if anyone has any particular varieties they're particular, you know, they're very excited about or they really want to to get out there, please just get in touch with us. You know, we're, we're very open to trialing new things and uh, spreading the word. Um, so yeah, it was the Heritage Seed Library. Grant, okay. I think I, I answered it fairly, fairly appropriately. Thanks, Sinead. Um, are there any more questions from anyone before we go for a break for the presenters? So, any questions? Okay. Um, so yeah, so if everyone's happy just to have a five minute screen break and whatever you need to do for five minutes and then we'll come back at uh, 2.25 um, and then we'll go into uh, breakout rooms and have a bit more discussion why is seed sovereignty important. So see you back here at 2.25.
welcome back folks um sorry my computer is doing funny things um <laughs> fortunately becky is helping us with the tech side of things which is great um so yeah so we couldn't really run a session on why is seed sovereignty important without a bit of discussion um and we were invited to offer this session by uh the conference organizers so um, so yeah, so uh, hopefully Becky's going to put us into breakout rooms uh, of small groups. I think we'll probably be about four or five people in the group. Um, and then I guess if we just answer that question, why is seed sovereignty important? And I suppose we can uh, really answer that for ourselves and maybe add the question, what are we doing about it? Um, so, and we could just hear um, for a minute or two from each person. Um, uh, we've got about 15 minutes in the breakout rooms and then 15 minutes uh, back together. We could have a bit of a broader discussion, you know, hearing back from the different groups. Um, and there might be the odd thing that comes out that, you know, people think, oh, well, I'd really like to do that, you know, with you because I've just discovered you want to do the same thing and it would be great to hear about anything like that. So um, thank you, Becky. It's fine. I'm just twiddling around because the numbers of like the numbers have changed slightly. So I'm just uh, we'll be three rooms with, uh, uh, with, okay, a, with a good sorry. range of people in. But yeah, all right. I'll I'll open them now so you can all get in. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so yeah. So just click on the join button, and at the end you'll be invited to come back to the main room if you've not been in breakout rooms before. Okay. between Newcastle University and a grain cooperative in Northumberland called Coastal Grains. Um, and the whole point was to develop supply chains for alternative grains. So the big example we did is spelt. Um, but it's on a slightly different scale than a lot of the examples that we're talking about today. But access to seed and seed sovereignty still has an effect on how that kind of project worked. We're basically limited in the kind of variety of spelt that we could use because there's really only one variety that's commercially available in the UK at the minute um, on a large scale. And even though there's others that exist, um, it it's the kind of thing where if you want multiple arable farmers to grow something on a scale that a, a customer for this grain cooperative would be willing to buy, which is like um at least initially like 50 tons but then ultimately like thousands of tons <laughs> and you you need to have access to certified seed but then i'm also aware of like the the yq work that's happening with the organic research center to try to get seed available that might fit different like basically just have a population that's available that'll suit lots of different environments which makes a lot of sense to me um so yeah, I come at this conversation very much from the mindset of like, how do we make it work on a scale that actually would work for the kind of arable growers that I work with in Northumberland? Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And, and it's, it's great that uh, Maria talked a bit about grain. And yeah. I think, interestingly, what the Heritage, uh, not Heritage, the Seed Sovereignty Programme is doing with people working with grain is trying to revive, uh, you know, some heritage seeds. So mm -hmm. at the moment, it's quite small scale compared to what you're talking about, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so yeah, how do we bulk up what we're doing? Because uh, I think uh, Sinead, one of her figure statistics was that 80% of our seeds imported. So if we want that seed here, we really need to work. And, it, and ideally quite quickly, I mean, permaculture has small and sm slow solutions as one of the principles. And I like to work with permaculture, but sometimes 
some of these things seem like actually this needs to happen quite quickly, especially with new regulations coming in, potentially coming in. Mm. It's like, oh, anyway, I'll let someone else yeah. talk. Yeah, thanks. I'd like to get your details. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was um, quite, yeah, quite interested about, I can't remember who it was who was saying it. Was it Sinead about how Brexit might affect um what you know I, I hadn't even thought about that so that's even more frightening they'll be in a worse position than we are now so yeah, it definitely seems even more important to um to to find ways to grow you know a, a wide variety of seeds um, and not just ones that commercial growers want to grow yeah yeah no it's definitely been the whole it's interesting to hear too that the um, there's work on like legislation because that's such a huge hindrance to this whole thing. Like the the fact that it it is so problematic, and I've I've experienced when like the expense of certified seed would prevent a grower from trying something new, whereas if they could use their neighbor's farm save seed, they totally would. And there's certainly things that you can do. You can get derogations and work things out but also if you don't have proper documentation it can completely muck up things for you in the short term and potentially the long term so i don't know as much about those legislative hurdles but they seem like it's good yeah. that people who know what they're doing are start are working on it um Sinead's working with um a lawyer in i think brussels on on some uh, well working with small packet registration so registering smaller like varieties new varieties or, or varieties uh, that are available but uh, to sell it as open pollinated seed you have to register it and mm -hmm. and then there's the kind of opt out where you're not selling so much that so you don't have to register it and defer at the moment turns a blind eye but it's not official and it might be with things like brexit that that becomes official like you have to register but it's 700 pounds for each yeah. registration so you've got to produce a lot of seed to make it worth it or you've got to know you're gonna produce a lot um and then with grains it's slightly different because it's agricultural it's it's uh, another set of legislation and you're not even i think officially meant to swap the seeds so I think with spelt, yeah. you're not even meant to swap it, which mm -hmm. is crazy. <laughs> but yeah, Becky, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I can just, I'm, I'm really glad to be obviously like hosting this session because it's just, uh, it's a topic that I've been, so yeah, I, well, I've got, we have an allotment, we help with, we have help with a community garden. Um, I'm involved in very involved in food futures here. So Anna Clayton, obviously, and Dennis, who are like really passionate about seed have been getting me into it and teaching me all sorts of things. And and so I have started like trying to save like seed on my own, really, but I'm coming up against kind of, you know, and how little I know and also how many things it feels like are better done in community. Um the dilemma that I'm having at the moment, actually, and this is in relation to, to the um, community gardens, we've been establishing a wildflower meadow, and um, which has been going really well, but we're trying to convert another patch at the moment, and I can't get hold of any yellow rattle. Like Emil's Gate, who's my usual supplier, apparently because of a really dry spring, um, there's none. And someone just told me today on Facebook, another company does have some, but it's it's going for, the price is now 400 to 700 pounds a kilo. So um, I'm really glad that actually I did, a few weeks ago, I did actually dash out onto my own very like mini meadow on the front, like but our front garden is like a mini meadow. And I dashed out and, and sa like saved quite a lot of my own yellow rattle. But obviously that only goes it's like a small area so um so yeah that really you know when you can't even I mean I know that's you know when you can't even buy stuff it makes me yeah really realize this is really urgent actually <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and that that's sort of part of the whole question of how much should be shared how much should be sold you know how are prices regulated because it's that's crazy <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely and I feel like, I mean, at the moment, I don't, you know, so I'm, because I'm sort of still quite new to it. So on the allotment, we've always saved like, you know, runner beans and peas and things like that. And, um, you know, so we carry on doing that. And, but this year I've tried to do, you know, just started um, with other easy things. So like chives, marigolds, like, yeah, other kinds of wildflowers. And I was just, I was really enjoying, like I was sorting them over a cup of coffee the other morning and it was just really not like, it was really quite meditative and I loved how they were all different and 
yeah um but i feel like you know it's in terms of getting into like you know the whole obviously land races and this you know sort of spe special types of breeding pepper and stuff that you're doing i mean i would love to learn more about that but i think that's the sort of thing i would do with others like you know rather than on my own so i'm hoping that anna and dennis and I don't know if we've got these little now around Lancaster. We've, we're setting up these so and so libraries. So, so as in S E W and S O W, because it's like a collaboration with a local kind of slow fashion, um, kind of uh, eco fashion movement thing. So, they're like little cabinets around the city where people are swapping, like, yeah, ribbons, zips, seeds, like for basic things for both types of sewing. They're really beautiful. And we've had some really nice swaps and like seed put in there already but now it's like right that's an additional reason to save seed because i need stuff to put in the cabinets <laughs> yeah it sounds really exciting i was looking up some bits about that yesterday yeah i'd love to be able to get stuff like that um happening a bit more around here as well um, mm. definitely um you know the the lancaster seed library as well that uh, that i was you know reading a bit more about that yeah it sounds great um but yeah i think i think um the stuff that we're doing here it's not it's not really that hard like i i mean it um andrew definitely you know he's got more of a background in that kind of sciencey way of approaching things but um i think in terms of like developing the land races it's just been really interesting because you 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 want to think about what qualities that you want in your land race and then but then actually trying to go out and find those varieties is really difficult and sometimes really frustrating if you see uh, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts um, from the um, the open source seed initiative and things like that that are happening in America and places like that and then you know you can't get hold of the seed and it's really frustrating because you're thinking oh yeah this variety that they're talking about yeah, that would be perfect addition to my mix but then you know you, you can't actually get a hold of it so, yeah, it's quite frustrating sometimes um but yeah it's really uh, i'm really interested in in the the whole land race i mean we've done quite a bit of breeding on trying to grow you know specific varieties and like dehybridizing tomatoes so that they go from being f1s to actually being open pollinated mm -hmm. you know? yeah yeah so that's been really interesting, but actually to, to do the opposite of that, you know, by doing the land races where you just kind of throwing it all together and it's, you know, you, you're not, you're trying to do the opposite really, because you're trying to get more genetic diversity rather than reducing that down. Ah, is that what it is? Sorry. I was like, I was, yeah, I'm still trying to get my head around the terminology. So land races, <laughs> when you've got a few like specific varieties, but you're kind of going, you all have like nice elements in this area and we're going to let you yeah. all combine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you're kind of, you're getting maximum genetic diversity by throwing a load of um, things together. And then like we've been doing beans and there were some that this spring and um, they just got decimated by slugs. So it's kind of like self-selecting that mm. the ones that get decimated by slugs have been through, you know, natural uh, <laughs> selection have just been um, sort of weeded out of the selection really um but you know it might be that we add some other kind of varieties in there in the future if we see one that we like some qualities of you know just kind of mix it all up in a bag and then just you know sew it that way so yeah it's kind of doing the opposite to traditional breeding where you're sort of trying to select out and get everything to grow you know uniform so that when you sow a seed everything grows the same it's yeah. kind of you know it's almost like doing the opposite really um, it's interesting with squash squash because when you have squash land races you know they can look quite different mm. so i guess that's part of part of what you yeah i mean the ones the the ones behind me that in a way that was we bred our own varieties um by doing intentional crosses yeah. but then after we'd found um some that were really nice and we found that particularly if you crossed crown prince and burgess buttercup all the um ones that grew from that had all the qualities that we wanted they tasted delicious they stored really well and also um i didn't i forgot to mention it but one of the other things is having like a um a really small cavity so you know some pumpkins you slice them open and it's just all like air <laughs> with some seeds yes. in. So it's actually, to be halloween lanterns but not so good yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so one of the other things that we bred for was um to be really dense so the seed cavity is quite small um, but you still obviously get enough seed to sow more um so that 
that we found that from this cross, uh, all of the ones that we grew from that had all these qualities that we really liked. So we just decided to, rather than try and go down the road of getting one exact um, variety where everything is uniform, that we just grow this mix every year and we just let them open pollinate and see what happens. So yeah, it's kind of really nice because when you, you don't really know what you're going to expect and you can't see most of the fruits because of the leaves. And then as you're harvesting them, you know, you're thinking, oh, this one's, you know, got ridges on like the sweet meat and this one's quite green like the Burgess buttercup. So, you know, it's kind of a bit more interesting as well. See, that's good. That sounds like the kind of seed saving I could do because, I, <laughs> you know, you have to put like bags on stuff and isolate it and then you have to have like 20 of this plant. And I think I haven't got space or time to like, yeah. you know, about that. but I can do the, you know, you lot all grow well here and you can all get on and the, the good ones. I'll, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Becky, sorry to interrupt. Are you all right to take us back to the main room? I can. Do you want me to give people a bit of a warning? Like, Maybe, yeah, a minute, it's fine. So I do two minute warning or something and then bring them back. Or, or just one, because I think it's nice warning. to have a bit of feedback. Yeah. In the, in the can I just Thank ask me, Amelia, are, are you doing like, are you studying um, plant breeding? Is that? Well, so I just, um, I've just finished this project and I'm actually kind of in between things and figuring out what I'm going to do next. I did a PhD that involved um, growing spelt and rye varieties in experimental field plots. And then also we did a farmer participatory trial. And then for the past like year and a half, I was working on this project that was a collaboration between the university and um, Coastal Grains, which is a farmer member grain storage cooperative. Um, so yeah, and now that project had like a deadline. So now it's just ended, I'm kind of in between things, but the conference timing ended up being a good, I might, we're, I've organized a panel to kind of talk about some of that work and also oh, it's cool. the people who have been involved in using alternative grains um, kind of in the greater Newcastle area to also talk about how when that's is been your working out. Panel? Next Tuesday at 10 30 in the morning. Cool. Um, is that part of the conference, Mia? Yeah. Oh, cool. I'll look I imagine out Maria will be really interested as well and lots of other things. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's been, uh, you end up kind of hearing about some things and then not other things, especially in a research project. Um, because yeah, the, it'd be interesting to talk to Maria about like the processing side of things, because that's a problem well, on yeah. like every scale. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> yeah. problematic on a small scale, but I was finding it was also a problem because um, we were trying to de hull buckwheat for the better part of two years. Um, <laughs> there's um, there's also on any scale. Sorry, there's also a coordinator in Wales who's uh, working with oats um, farmers as well yeah. in case that's of interest i know the de-hulling is usually like the the de-hulling machines seem to have all disappeared even on the small scale yeah. it's kind of like well, that, what the would, they not, would they not germinate without the de-huller then is that the thing or it's mostly that people are used to buying them de hulled so the people that okay. find them as an ingredient want the holes off <laughs> okay <laughs> for buckwheat at least that's okay the yeah, the yeah. Sorry, we slightly shifted the timings. Uh, so there's a bit of time now to feedback from groups. Um, you know, if there's any kind of key conversations that you'd like to share with the bigger group, perhaps we could ask each, someone from each group to say something. I could ask, I could invite some people who haven't said anything, if that's not too scary. <laughs> Katie, I can see you. You're next on my screen, actually. Would you like to share anything from your group? Um, yeah, hi, Charlie. Hi, nice <laughs> to see you. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we had a lot of chat, actually. Um, yeah, we kind of, we, we did all share where we came from in terms of, um, yeah, sea sovereignty and our backgrounds around that and our passions around it and... Um, yeah, we discussed, um, yeah, some, yeah, maybe kind of some themes about why um, sea sovereignty is important, you know, kind of politically, um, culturally, <laughs> um, for our health as well. And, you know, not just for our physical health, but our 
emotional and mental well-being of keeping that connection with our culture and with um yeah with you know on a basic level um saving a seed and re them and growing your own food is incredibly empowering on whatever level whether you're a you know a large broad-scale farmer small holder or somebody you know growing food in pots in a backyard yeah thank you sounds like you had a great discussion <laughs> broad ranging um and um, christopher would you mind sharing something if you were in, i don't know maybe you're in the same group but you're welcome to share something as well you're muted can you unmute there we go yes can you hear me now yes yeah uh yeah we're just uh, much the same sort of thing um and we were discussing just generally about seeds and how the connection is important to get that connection between uh, the seed the soil the environment and because I've grown varieties for a long time that fit that just our environment and that's so important but also I think the other point we came out was obviously about connect <coughs> excuse me about connecting to people and actually uh, trying to get the whole idea across to people as well so they, they, they people buy into the whole idea and I think that's important too to actually get the, the idea that the seed and the Obviously, I, I'm thinking about the whole thing. I'm not just talking about the seed itself. That's part of it. But that's, you've got the soil, you've got the seed, you've got the, the production, and you've got the selling of it uh, or, 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 or the distribution of it. And the whole thing, the people, the consumer needs to be um, brought into that too. And I think that's important. Um, that was my take on it anyway. So, uh. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I guess the key theme is connections, really, isn't it? And that's what I've heard in both of what, what you've reflected so far. Um, uh, Aidley, would you like to share anything? I hope people don't mind me going around. It's just nice to hear different voices as well. <laughs> you just need to unmute. You're still muted, Aidley. Oh, you've mute. maybe you're muted again. Oh. No, she's still there. There you are. Am I here? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. You can. Good. Yes. I can't see me, but that doesn't matter. So now I'm just um, picking everybody's brains because it's so great not to be the only one on the vegetable patch slogging away. Um, so just keep teaching me. I mean, I've grown things for years. Um, but it's like Christopher says, I don't think people hardly realise what a seed is nowadays. You know what empowerment is a seed? A little seed has all that genetic information to grow a huge tree. It's like people need to wonder again at how it's all made and fits together and then connect it all up and get excited about life out there, not just within four walls and on a computer. So I know there's so many facets to it, aren't there? And I love it that you all represent something different that's on your heart that you um, green the area up about. You have a place and, you know, to speak into and influence. So carry on, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's nice. Okay. Um, does anyone else want to say something? I think, uh, Chris, we maybe haven't heard from you. And then anyone else who has also spoken before? Chris, would you like to say anything? There's no, no pressure, not obligatory. Okay, I don't know if Chris can hear us, but um, if you'd like to say anything, Chris, feel free or you're welcome to put in the chat, if not. Perhaps I can ask a question. Uh, yeah, go for it. Because we were in the same session. Um, will an email with some general information be sent out to all the participants? Um, we can certainly do that, yeah. Um, Oh, Sinead. Oh, and uh, Sinead's reminded me of something. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. um, there, is, <laughs> there is a survey that the Seed Sovereignty Programme um, have collated and would love your feedback. Um, it's really asking if you've come across the Seed Sovereignty Programme, if you have, you know, how it's maybe influenced, um, uh, you know, what you're doing or how you see seed sovereignty. So that would be really useful for us. And um, Sinead and Maria and myself are from the programme and Hans, in fact, as an advisor and co-founder of the uh, Seed Court. So um, 
yeah so feel free to uh fill in the survey i'll pop that in the chat but um i could certainly uh well we could certainly collate a bit of information if that's useful for people if you'd like to share an email then we could certainly uh send uh some links and also uh we do have the seed sovereignty program we've got um like um e i think you've got an e-group have you Sinead? like a general group because i certainly there's un sorry yeah so basically um if you are in the north of england and you want to find out more about trainings or events or things that we're going to be offering get in touch with Charlie if you're in Ireland and Islands of Scotland get in touch with Maria uh, Lowlands and Central Scotland Richie who was here earlier if you're not really sure who to get in touch with get in touch with me and I'll direct you to the right person um, yeah. and just to to say very quickly about the survey obviously um, we we have been running since 2017 but Charlie is um, the first of, of the Northern English coordinators so that's quite new in this area so if you haven't heard from us that's not unexpected um so uh you know some of the questions might not apply there is a, a a raffle if you fill out the survey 30 pounds of seeds from the seed co-op oh my goodness so please do fill it out um you'll get some you might get some lovely open pollinated uh seed from the seed co-op um but it really helps us find out where people are at and what people really want to focus on uh, and so that will really help charlie uh in the north finding out uh what everyone is is wanting to do and, and yes, please feel free to share your emails um, and we can add you to uh, and you maybe just say if you want to be on the northern or the England or the, uh, you know, Maria's email list in um, Highlands and Islands and Richie. If you just tell us, tell us where you are and we'll, we'll make sure you get on the right list. <laughs> But do you have a general list, Sinead? That's so there isn't, there isn't a no. newsletter okay. for the Seed Sovereignty Programme okay. specifically. There is a newsletter for Gaia, the Gaia Foundation. Ah, so okay. you can access that via the Gaia website or if you just give me a shout, I can stick you on. If you fill out the survey, uh -huh, um, there's actually, you can just ask to be put on directly from that. So I would recommend you fill out the survey, really. Okay. Um, that's the easiest way to get in touch. <laughs> but yeah, um, and we also, you know, we have all the, the social media presences so you can you can find us on there on twitter and facebook and all that jazz um i'll just put the seed sovereignty website as well so the the survey's in the chat and um this is the seed sovereignty website if anyone else wants to share any links uh, feel free um, yeah so i guess uh if anyone else has anything they want to say feel free and uh, otherwise we can uh, you know, we can finish off a little bit early. It seems like most people are happy with what they're doing and, you know, animated and wanting to share. So that's great. Okay. Thank great. you to all of you. It was a really interesting session. <laughs> yeah. And I, I noticed, yeah, in the chat, we, we did hear from Amelia about uh, a lot, much larger scale uh, work with uh, spelt and rye so that was really interesting to think about grains Maria um, so you might want to be in touch if you, um, um, yeah feel free to share your contacts in the chat for anyone you want to be in touch with as well if you feel okay with that um, but yeah otherwise thank you for attending and thank you to Becky for all the amazing tech support especially with my dodgy <laughs> laptop and connection at the moment <laughs> um, yeah welcome. thank you Thank you very much to all the presenters and, and uh, yeah, fantastic to, it was really great to hear you all presenting together and, and uh, such a, you know, variety of perspectives on seed sovereignty and what it means. Okay, so yeah, go well folks and uh, maybe see you in another session during the conference. Thank you. And please fill in the survey. <laughs>